Beans, beans, magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's vlog is sponsored by Foddy, and I'm gonna be taking you with me through my very long, low FODMAP elimination diet and trial. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, Foddy Foods. So Foddy was a game changer for me in this process. As a super busy person now with two kids and a business to run, I was really honestly quite anxious about starting this whole low FODMAP trial because I knew how much from scratch cooking I would probably have to do. Like onions and garlic are two of the main sources of FODMAPs that I would have to eliminate in the first phase. And onion and garlic, are in everything. So I don't honestly always have time to make every single sauce and seasoning from scratch. So I was really worried about having to eat basically everything super boring and super bland. But Foddy has a wide range of products that make eating low FODMAP so much easier and more enjoyable. And that allows people with food sensitivities to say yes to flavors that they already love. So they have salsa, sauces, dressings, spice seasoning mixes, and oils, all of which are certified low FODMAP by the Monish Institute. I honestly love their pasta sauce, probably even more than my homemade version. So kudos to them for that major win. So if you're suffering from digestive issues, bloating, or are considering trialing a low FODMAP diet, say yes with Foddy Foods and visit the link in the description and use my promo code ABBY15 for 15% off. Also, you can pause my screen to read my disclaimer, but I do want to flag that I do not, I repeat, do not recommend that everybody eat a low FODMAP diet without speaking to your doctor and dietitian. This is a therapeutic diet process which should be carefully monitored and structured by a professional, and it's not meant to be a lifelong diet. This video may also be triggering to those with histories of restrictive eating, so feel free to skip this if it's not supportive to your journey. So I wanna start by very quickly explaining what the heck a low FODMAP elimination trial is and why you shouldn't all race out to start this as a weight loss fad. So FODMAP stands for fermentable oligo di monosaccharides and polyols. So these are short chain carbohydrates that are poorly digested. So they often sit and ferment in the intestine where they can cause gas, diarrhea, cramps, and bloating. Since giving birth, I've been dealing with really severe gas distension and painful bloating. And it just seems like it's been getting worse since I did my first video on the topic, which you can watch right here. So after the holidays, I decided that if there was ever a time to do an elimination diet, it would probably be easiest when we're in lockdown in you know COVID times and I'm not being invited out every single weekend for dinner with friends. So I hired my colleague, Ali Kugler, who specializes in digestive nutrition, and she helped me safely go through a three-step protocol with her motivation and support. Also, I think it's really strange that when I mentioned that I had an RD on my Instagram post, so many of you said that it was was like so meta that a dietitian would need to see a dietitian. What? But honestly, why not? Like therapists see therapists and professional athletes have athlete coaches. We all need mentorship and support to grow and to see the bigger picture. But I think this serves as a really good reminder to all of you that even if you think you know what you're doing with this diet, it's actually very complicated, intense, and requires a lot of dedication and work. And therefore, I do strongly urge getting professional assistance to ensure that you're not unnecessarily restricting and also still meeting your nutrient needs. Okay, so back to FODMAPs. There are different classes or categories of FODMAPs, each of which have a variety of major food sources. So the common FODMAPs include fructose, which is found in foods like honey, asparagus, pears, ripe banana, and apples. Lactose, found in dairy products like milk, cheese, and ice cream. Fructans, which are found in foods like garlic, onions, cabbage, and also in grains like wheat. Galacto-oligosaccharides, aka galactins, which are found in legumes and soy products. 
and then polyols, which are found in a ton of fruit and veg like blackberries, cauliflower, mushrooms, plums, and also in sugar alcohol sweeteners like mannitol and sorbitol. I did a lot of symptom tracking myself in the many weeks leading up to my first meeting with Ali. So I had already kind of narrowed down the most likely culprits to be vegetables, beans, and possibly some fruit. So because I just knew I honestly did not have the bandwidth to take on more than I needed to, and also I didn't want any extreme restriction to trigger me in any way based on my history with orthorexia, I opted to do a modified low FODMAP elimination, what I kind of call low FODMAP light. So in other words, for me, I decided that I wasn't gonna fuss too much about having some wheat or dairy in my diet, and I was gonna focus on what I was more confident was causing the issues. Honestly, I'm running on like four hours of nightly sleep trying to work with two kids during legit pandemic. It would probably have been a slippery slope for me and my mental health if I had to give up ice cream and regular pasta in addition to some of my go-to staple vegetables. I also wanna make it super clear that the low FODMAP diet is kinda a misnomer because you're not supposed to do phase one for your life. This should also not be used as a weight loss diet. I know that I've heard of a lot of folks using the rigidity of the low FODMAP diet to kind of mask or disguise disordered eating or to justify extreme caloric restriction. So this is why I really do urge you to approach this with professional supervision and also with the mindset that this is just a temporary test. I repeat, it's a test, not a long-term diet. The goal here is to get to the other side with a very clear indication of exactly which foods cause you trouble and exactly how much you can tolerate so that hopefully, you don't need to actually eliminate much in the long run. Okay, so how does this work? Phase one, the elimination. This involves eating only low FODMAP foods or moderate FODMAP foods in the quantities that render them essentially low FODMAP. The first phase here generally takes around two to six weeks to get complete resolution of your symptoms before you can move on to phase two. Now, if I were to give you any suggestions based on my experience, it would be to do your grocery shopping after you have your plan in place because I ended up with a lot of things in my fridge that I wasn't supposed to eat. I'm annoyed I didn't think about this before I got my groceries today, but cashew milk is high FODMAP and soy milk is high FODMAP. So probably should have bought almond milk this week. I guess I'm going shopping again. And I did, which also meant I need to do a proper taste test of three different almond milks to determine the best one for my ritualistic morning latte. Honestly, I already felt like I was giving up so much, so I wanted to make sure that my coffee still was an enjoyable part of my day, even if it meant spending a little bit more on non-dairy milk that week. Approved. Mm, that's a 10. So yeah, the first few days were really hard because I had a lot of high FODMAP foods still in the fridge that I am kind of just used to basically popping in my mouth whenever I want. So it was definitely an exercise in more mindful eating. Reason number 529 why this is a challenge for me <laughs> as I'm like cleaning up my kids dinner plate and like putting his scraps into the garbage like it's just my inherent instinct to just like pop random pieces of his leftovers in my mouth a lot of which were probably not low FODMAP so I need to be a lot more mindful about that probably in general but I think that's something that a lot of moms probably do I also felt like telling myself not to eat something was just a setup for making me want it even more, obviously. Classic diet mentality right here, except for with vegetables. Um, I know I'm not supposed to have a lot of broccoli right now, and I have this cooked delicious looking broccoli that I made for my son staring at me, and I just want to eat it so badly. Mm. But to do this properly without feeling deprived, I knew that I had to dedicate extra time to home cooking and food prep. So I put all the low FODMAP veggies on my shopping list and I got shopping. So bell pepper and cucumber 
not my favorite vegetables of all time, but they are low FODMAP. So I did purchase a bunch and I'm gonna chop them up and get them ready for just like grab and go options. Um, and that way I'm not like just kind of mindlessly reaching for a piece of like broccoli or cauliflower or something else that's being prepared in the fridge for my son. I've got some options that are ready to go and also a little bit easier on the gut for me. I gotta say, bell peppers used to not be my favorite, but they're growing on me. I just wish I had some hummus for dipping. But that wouldn't go so well. My dietitian and I agreed to limit my raw veggie and salad intake to no more than one raw veggie dish a day, made obviously with low FODMAP veggies. So I would be eating basically most of my vegetables cooked. And that meant a lot of meal prep. We did fennel today, folks. Roasted fennel mm. with balsamic and olive oil. So good, I totally forgot I actually liked fennel. I forgot all about fennel. So this is actually good. It's actually kind of reintroducing me to some long lost veggies and fruit that maybe I kind of forgotten about. So this is kind of a good thing. Mm. <sighs> worth, worth the loss of potential taste buds. I also had to eliminate legumes, which are a huge staple in my diet. So that did mean relying on more animal protein during these weeks, which I just kind of had to be okay with. Extra firm tofu is low FODMAP, so I did eat a lot of that, but basically most other plant-based sources of protein are not. So I definitely would imagine that this phase of the diet would be extra challenging for some of my plant-based friends. I also relied a lot on my Fadi products for adding flavor without having to make everything from scratch. So many prepared sauces and dips and seasonings contain onions and garlic and other FODMAPs. I mean, like everything has onion and garlic in it. So it was a huge relief to be able to have some ready-made options and snacks that I could just rely on to get me through this first elimination phase. I also knew that I couldn't go months without ordering some takeout in. So I found basically the lowest possible FODMAP options during those weeks. And I gave myself the flexibility and the grace to do just that. In some cases, it would mean going for some of the less healthy takeout options. But honestly, it really did not matter at all to me, as I totally just needed some relief from the monotony of roasted low FODMAP veg. Just saying. But alas, I survived. And for the most part, I tried to make meals that were both satiating and satisfying so that I didn't feel deprived. Here are some of the things that I ate. But I also had some hard days where honestly, I just kind of wanted to go eat a tub of hummus and totally give up. And I think that was a really good reminder to me as a healthcare professional, just how challenging some of these major diet changes can be for people and how much empathy we need to have as clinicians for those who take them on. So I'm having a bit of a rough day today. I don't know what it is. If it's just, you know, O was up really early this morning and I didn't sleep well. And, you know, I just feel so exhausted and overwhelmed trying to do so much meal prep. Like, honestly, I, it's like all I do is cook vegetables and, and I just, I don't know. I just feel like I'm worried that I'm gonna have to do this for the rest of my life or choose between being comfortable and being overwhelmed. So yeah, and I, I mean, if I'm struggling with this, I can't imagine how everyone else feels who, you know, don't have the nutrition knowledge base that I have, not to mention I'm not even doing this full out. I'm doing like a low FODMAP, like a mini low FODMAP. Yeah, I, I have so much empathy for anyone who's dealing with digestive issues and attempting to balance motherhood or parenthood and work and this very restrictive elimination phase. It's rough. So I'm literally counting down the hours until my next appointment with my dietitian so that I can hopefully 
get to the bottom of what I can ease up on a little bit. So maybe to make it a little bit easier for me. But I will say that the silver lining was that I was reminded of my love for some fruits and vegetables that I had totally neglected or basically forgotten about over the years. I used to really hate cantaloupe. I saw it as like the runt of the fruit salad that nobody wanted. The filler, you know? And it is a filler. Like they, they people at restaurants, like restaurants always pack their fruit salads full of cantaloupe and honeydew melon because it's cheap. And then they don't have to give you as many the good things like berries. But I'm starting to appreciate the old cantaloupe. It's sweet and it's juicy and it's cold and refreshing. And it's low FODMAP. I have a new, I have a new love. All right, let's talk about what I learned in phase two. Number one, <clears throat> I do not really like cooked bell peppers. Hard pass from me. I also don't love eggplant at all, unless I would say it's like breaded, pan fried, and loaded with cheese. So two, I am obsessed with parsnips and carrots. I guess I totally forgot about parsnips somehow. And I've been eating an exorbitant amount of carrots because it's probably one of the only low FODMAP vegetables that I actually really like. So much so that my hands are even more orange than normal. And no, there's nothing wrong with me. This is just like a genetic situation and it's totally benign. It's nothing that you need to worry about. Three, I desperately miss broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and cabbage and all those sulfurous vegetables which I know is such a geeky dietitian thing to be even talking about because it's like not even, it's not that I miss ice cream and, and bread, I miss vegetables, specifically vegetables that stink. Um, so yeah, oh, I do miss a good Brussels sprout. Mm -hmm. Four, yeah, the big one is really that. I think like before, if my symptoms were like an eight or nine, now there may be more like a four or five, which is significant. That's a significant improvement. But I know like at the start of this, I guess I had some pretty lofty expectations just based on everything that people had said to me and that, you know, I, I read so many, so many people's success stories saying that, oh, you know, they, they completely got rid of all of their symptoms and, and you know, they're, they're bloating. They lost five inches in like two weeks because of all the bloating that just magically went away. Not a fart in the world and stuff. So it's like, yeah, that has not been my experience. First of all, I never really cared about the kind of bloating situation and the aesthetics of it, but I definitely still have significant pain and some discomfort and gas and things like that. So it's not like all, you know, all my symptoms are gone. And it really comes down to how rushed and stressed and exhausted um, I am feeling at that time of the meal. I think that's really what determines how it's gonna go. I'm kind of disappointed that it's probably all, you know, this is as good as it's gonna get, but you know, I guess it's better than it was. So let's move on to stage two. Next is phase two, the reintroduction. So this phase can take a while, usually two to three months or so. And again, I did a bit of an abbreviated version because I can't spend six months of my already overflowing life thinking about every single food I pop in my mouth. But essentially, Ali had me introduce a few different foods from each FODMAP category and introduce them over three days in gradually increasing serving sizes. This way we could catch when symptoms started to kind of flare up so that we would know exactly which foods and how much were an issue for me. So I went through the list of foods we agreed on and made very detailed notes on how each of them made me feel. Now, I have to say, it was a huge relief to be able to have a little bit more flexibility in my diet. You know, adding in small quantities of the foods that I hadn't had in a while felt so glorious and truly freeing. Like pear, for example, is kind of in season right now, and it was so nice to have a little bit with my breakfast. And cabbage, like, <gasps> I missed cabbage. So yeah, the reintroduction phase was strangely fun. So today is the last day of my cauliflower trial. And I have to tell you, I am so nervous because I love cauliflower and I'm just gonna be like really disappointed and sad to feel like I need to give it up 
or like at least be cautious about it. I know this is the whole point of doing a low FODMAP trial here is to get to the bottom of the exact foods that cause some digestive issues, but I'm just not ready to feel like this is the one. I know that's so sad. It could be worse. It could be ice cream. It could, it, it could be chocolate. It could be coffee. It could be honey. What a weird thing I just did. Who sniffs? Who opens up a, 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 a container of cauliflower and like gives her a good whiff? Five second rule. It's funny because as I do this, it's like I'm expecting this like napalm bomb to go off in my gut when obviously that's not how it happens, but I'm just waiting. So I was feeling pretty good having the cauliflower all on its own, but then as the day went on and I had some other vegetables and some other, you know, foods that maybe had some small trace amounts of FODMAPs in it. And basically what ended up happening was some FODMAP stacking. And I think that is where I run into issues. So I guess what I've learned from this is that like a cauliflower dish on its own is probably no big deal. But if I'm going to have cauliflower and a little bit of broccoli and maybe some green beans and maybe like a little bit of lettuce, I might feel a little bit bloated and gassy after that. So all good data and all good information that I can keep in my back pocket for future meal plans. Alas, the show must go on. All right, this is what I've learned on phase two. It seems like the polyols, fructans, and galactins, thanks Poppy, are my biggest triggers. And a lot of the times they're fine in small amounts or even like large amounts, but it's when I start getting into like FODMAP stacking throughout the day. So basically like little bits of like low or moderate FODMAP foods start to build up as the day goes on that's when I end up having issues. I also find that I can tolerate those foods a lot better at like breakfast or lunch or like earlier on in the day than I can at dinner time because dinner time in my house is witching hour. And parents can, with young children can probably appreciate that eating with, toddler, with a toddler and a baby is hella stressful. So if you find that your IBS is triggered by stress, I don't know. That's a challenging, that's a challenging time to be eating, but I am big on family meals. I totally believe that they're so important because of all the research. And, and I really think that modeling healthy eating behaviors to my kids is probably a bigger priority to me than my digestion. So it's definitely a bit of a give and take and just something that I have, I'm going to have to balance probably for the next unforeseeable future with young children. All right, signing out, time for phase three. Now, finally, phase three, personalization. So this is basically coming to terms with a unique understanding of what I can now tolerate and in what amount. Ideally for most clients with IBS, you should now no longer need to restrict anything other than the few foods in the specific quantities or amounts that cause you symptoms. So that may mean that I can have a little bit of broccoli or a little bit of cauliflower, but probably not an entire whole bowl full. And ideally also not with other moderate FODMAP foods if we want to kind of avoid some of those FODMAP stacking effects that we saw. So low FODMAP isn't a diet. It's a process that gives you some insight to inform your food choices long term. Okay, so what does this mean for me? Like, am I never going to have a dish with cauliflower or broccoli in it again? No, of course I am. But just based on some of the data that I collected from this experience, you know, and knowing that my symptoms, my gas and bloating tend to be worse at kind of like family meals at the end of the day, rather than earlier on in the day when I eat alone, I might choose to save that broccoli or cauliflower for like, a leisurely date night out. That is if I ever get to leave the house without my children ever again. But I also might choose to like keep tabs on some of the smaller FODMAP sources that I eat throughout the day, just based on my experience that I had with FODMAP stacking. And if I wanna just kind of forget about all those learnings and data and say, F it, give me a whole dish of roasted cauliflower, then I might just have to sleep in the guest room that night. 
I don't know. But as for like the chickpeas and beans and things like that, that one is the hardest for me to come to terms with just because I worked so hard to transition my diet to more of like a flexitarian style diet for environmental reasons. But Ali did give me a really good tip. She said if I rinse beans really, really well, then I of course cook them, then I cool them, and then I rinse them again, that can help to remove some of the problematic oligosaccharides that give them their magical fruit status. But yeah, basically this is all just data and I can choose to do what I want with it when the time comes. I also figure I should chat about whether or not this experience was triggering for me coming from a history of disordered eating and orthorexia. Thankfully, I do think that I had a few things working in my favor that really helped me prevent getting into scarcity mentality. So first of all was that I only eliminated the foods that I was pretty confident were potential culprits based on some of the kind of diet recall and tracking that I was doing ahead of time. So this allowed me to still have a lot of my favorite fun foods like pizza and pasta and, and ice cream and things like that so that I could still participate in family meals and have fun and I didn't feel so deprived. So doing a modified low FODMAP trial like that where you're really only focusing on removing some of the major culprits culprits and, and the, the most common culprits is definitely recommended if you have a history of disordered eating or disordered eating tendencies. The second thing I did was that I was really prepared. So doing a lot of meal prep ahead of time every single week ensured that the default was that I always had something acceptable to eat in the fridge rather than the default being that I just wasn't going to eat. And three was definitely that I had the support of another dietitian. I cannot stress enough how important it is to work through this diet with a professional, with a registered dietitian, because this is not simple. If I needed that support, and this is my job, I definitely, definitely recommend it for all of you at home who are considering doing a low FODMAP trial. So I hope this gave you a bit of perspective on what the low FODMAP diet trial process looks like and also helped to clear up the misconception that low FODMAP is some kind of weight loss diet or even a diet that you stay on for the rest of your life. And on that note, thank you again to Foddy Foods for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below if you have any questions about FODMAPs or digestion. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.